Dames und kleine Dames, das war fantastisch. Echt top. Fantastik. Ich habe eine Frage für dich. Ich habe eine Frage für dich. Und du bist ein Frage-Antwort, right? Ja. How many times in the week do you practice? Two times in a week, but sometimes we practice for the small ones like him. Uh, his name is Mini Manu. And, uh, and also that we also learn other children's new instruments. Oh, so that you, you, sh you show them the instruments and tell them how to do it, right? Yes. Wow. <laughs> Second question. Is it really hard to play this fast together all the time? Ek moeilijk, or niet? No. <laughs> no? Because, because we can play very well in a, in a group, and, and most of all, we listen to each, each other. So you listen to each other, you play well in a group. Tell me, oh, who's the leader, though? Everybody is a leader. Right. Everybody is a leader. So, thank you, thank you well, merci, fun for kids, tot straks, huh? see you soon. So, a little bit humbling, right? Maybe if we practiced a little more during the week, we'd get our own choir going and soaring. We practiced yesterday, but a few more times you could get our rhythm right together and really work on things together. Fan for Kids is a wonderful initiative of MetEx, which is a Brussels-based organization that's been bringing together community and music for decades. Fan for Kids community is Molenbeek, and some of you, I think, might have joined the visit to Molenbeek this morning. Their, their own musical launch, their launch into the world was through Zinica Parada, and their inspiring director is Bart Nagels. Um, MedEx describes itself as a place by and for musicians. It was founded by the saxophone player Luc Michal, who last year was awarded the European Cultural Foundation Princess Marguerite Award for Culture. And Fan for Kids also roused the audience at that event as well. Uh, Luke was in, one, was in one of the sessions this afternoon. I hope some of you had the opportunity to, uh, to hear him and share in that session. And the, the, the award that was uh, presented recognizes the power of culture, the role of artists in all and every discipline to make change, to help us to change. And change is a life's work, and it has to start young. And together, with a drum, and a beat. Metex writes of their work, our acoustic universe is closely linked to that of the steaming capital, sometimes loud, sometimes soft, sometimes beautiful, sometimes ugly, never smooth, always exciting, moving music, music that moves. Today we will be talking about how culture can move communities, bringing about change. And our panelists are all artists, they know about time and timing, they know about hard work, and they know about rhythm and beat and working together. And they know that there's still a very long way to go. They know when loudness and making a lot of noise is vital. Yesterday, Jan Hosens, in his uh, keynote speech, mentioned that culture has the ability to provide protected, soft-spoken spaces of exchange, collaboration, and dialogue which is really so true and important, but culture can also make a loud noise, wake us up, shake us up, and get us together. So please join me in welcoming this afternoon's panel, Cem Mansour, conductor, music director, and founder of the, Nas the Turkish National Youth Philharmonic Orchestra, Cem.
Jenny Seeley, actor, director, artistic director of Grey Eye, a UK theatre company, and co-artistic director of the London 2012 Paralympic opening ceremony. Right. And Jenny is joined by Jenny Draper. <laughs> Jenny is joined by Jenny Draper, interpreter and an artist in her own right. Thank you, Jenny. And Lem Sisse, author, poet, broadcaster, and also chancellor of the University of Manchester. So, welcome to our living room. We're looking forward to a conversation between us, between you. I'm sorry I invited a few hundred other people to listen in, but uh, this is your conversation, really. I think you have a lot to say. Let's remember there are people there that really need to hear mm -hmm. what you have to say as well. Um, we thought to start off and to get everyone acquainted with your work, what we would do is do a short video, a couple of minutes. Following that, each of you is going to give a bit of a provocative opening statement, an impulse to our conversation, a conversation starter, maybe an icebreaker. Um, and then we'll have a chat together after that, but we can maybe do them one, one after another. And uh, yeah. so our intention was to bring also as much of the art on stage as we can. We couldn't bring the full orchestra or the full theater company, but we can bring you some images of the work that these fantastic artists are doing in community. Hello, my name is Jan Manser. I'm a conductor, and today I'd like to tell you about an event called the Laboratory of Democracy, which I hope you may be interested in my presenting with your orchestra. This is a session where I rehearse the orchestra in public, demonstrating issues such as coexistence, the different levels of leadership, the taking of responsibility, the nature of authority, the difference between hearing and listening, the difference between leading and following, the fact that as members of society we are dependent on one another as well as being responsible for one another. There was a time when words such as democracy and the symphony orchestra could not be mentioned in the same breath. But there have been changes, especially in the world of business, to the culture of leadership, and uh, indeed in any field where any question of leadership arises. The symphony orchestra these days presents us with the ideal metaphor for talking about issues that arise in a reasonably well-functioning democratic society. Issues such as individual worth, the limits of free expression, conflict resolution, compromise, all these questions as well as their answers exist on every page of every great symphony. The Laboratory of Democracy also aims to show that music, classical music, can work wonders for social cohesion and can be a great force for the integration of immigrant communities. Nowhere is the will to coexist as focused as it is in the symphony orchestra. And if I were to single out one thing that symphonic music is about, I would say that it is about seemingly irreconcilable voices coexisting in harmony. We can learn not only from the music itself as a great carrier of universal values, but also as a great force for social understanding. But we can also learn from the orchestra itself as a living element in society. The Laboratory of Democracy is an event that can be organized at short notice and very easily because it can take place during a rehearsal and uh, any repertoire that the orchestra is currently working on can be used for it. I am able to offer the Laboratory of Democracy in English, French, German or Italian and I'm also interested in making it into an interactive experience with the audience. I hope we can spend a session together to make the case for the continued support of live symphonic music as a relevant social phenomenon in a world where it has been taken for granted for too long. Beautiful. Tim. So, hello everybody, very good to see you. Um, remember when you haven't ironed your shirt properly, tell the um, cameraman no close shots, as in there. Um, <laughs> We uh, talked briefly there about uh, one of the main events we uh, organized with the Turkish National Youth Orchestra, 
obviously the laboratory of democracy, and uh, it's part of my belief that music is not just an ornament in life, uh, but it is a way, and music especially is a way, not a way f of escaping from life itself, but you know, a, a, a one of the best ways of coming to terms with, with life itself. Mm. And um, it's, I think it's important where this, this uh, Moto Culture Matters of this conference, uh, which I like very much, it's also important to notice that, um, to realize that culture matters, but it also matters that culture should be a space for dialogue in uh, areas where certain amounts of conflict exist and not used as yet another space for conflict. And uh, that's why whenever I spoke, speak of music, especially symphonic music, the great polyphonic tradition based in Western Europe and Central Europe, uh, as the greatest potential force for social change, I see people thinking, well, there he goes again, these, you know, uh, with these exaggerated ideas. But when you look at what's been achieved uh, with symphonic music, starting into this extraordinary El Sistema in Venezuela, uh, it mm. is no wonder that um, education of classical music is really the shortest, um, surest, cheapest way for, as, a, uh, of, as a civilizing force, as a force for social integration. And integration here means, obviously, we're talking about integration at several, several levels. One can talk about integration uh, in a general sense where immigrant communities exist and uh, also as a way of integration of, uh, of various, various voices, as I tried to mention there. Uh, when we organized the Laboratory of Democracy in Berlin last summer, before our concert at the Young Euro Classic Festival at the, at the Concert House, we had, our concert was, uh, was uh, televised worldwide, live by uh, RT television. But we had, what we had in the, in the afternoon, uh, in place of a general rehearsal, we invited uh, 1,600 people who would ne normally never come into the concert house, people who live there and people who contribute with their taxes to what goes on that stage. And, uh, and trying to tell them why music is such a great way for them to feel at home in more than one particular cultural identity. And that cultural identity is not a, it's not a football game. You don't need to choose whether to support one side or another. I remember after playing the initial uh, piece, uh, I addressed the audience, and the first thing I said, said, here we are, an orchestra from today's Turkey, uh, just a stone's throw from the Bundestag, and we're here to give you a lesson in democracy. Very credible, isn't it? And of course, that's not what it was about, because it was about, uh, and I said so, was that it was about what the orchestra, what music in Turkey could be, and more importantly, what it would what could, it could represent as to what Turkey itself could be as a society where conflicting elements are actually coexisting uh, and, um, and uh, where, we, where we can help uh, uh, create a culture of, of listening to one another. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the elements of the liberative democracy is obviously the, uh, the seemingly irreconcilable ex you know, extremes. Uh, to, to exist, and I know that whenever you, uh, you know, when you look at a society where the uh, education for polyphonic music is not taken seriously, it has a direct correlation in the way people drive, have a discussion, uh, use uh, violent means of expression when they want to, and these things are directly related. Perhaps we don't have so much time to talk about that today, but uh, I believe it is a, it, I'm sometimes uh, accused of a slightly Eurocentric view when I talk about the classical uh, tradition. The classical music is a term I dislike generally, but let's say the polyphonic um, tradition expressing universals. It just makes it even more uh, incomprehensible. But um, it has to do with values, I think. Values uh, that the whole of humanity uh, ascribes to these days, and those values which were actually achieved during key points of the great classical uh, tradition undergoing key changes. Beethoven has to do with the you know, declaration of, 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 of the rights of man, or with the, French Revolution, uh, with the French Revolution. The miracle of Bach would have been impossible without the Reformation, and, uh, and the tradition of the Renaissance coming from Italy and allowing street music, etc., into the church. So it's all uh, interconnected. And one of the things I think that's very important that, class that classical music teaches, I talked about identities earlier. Um, the French um, philosopher and gourmet, Brias Savarin, at least it's mostly attributed to him, said, you are what you eat. And I'd like to uh, take that a little further and say, you are what you listen to. And what you listen to does not need to be only one thing. Uh, I'm very often asked, uh, so you're from Turkey, um, so are you a Turk then? Uh, my answer is normally, well, how long have you got? 
Hmm. Uh, let me tell you about what, what I mean in a non-ethnic non sense or an ethnic sense and talk about my various levels of identity. Uh, but um, again, uh, talking about those seemingly irreconcilable differences, I think playing in an orchestra and the existing, uh, the, the very existence of symphony orchestras in a society, I think has to do with, uh, is, can show us that, is, uh, that it is possible to, for concepts such as uh, habits, uh, the habits of a society and tradition and innovation coexisting for uh, the ideas of reason and faith which are normally seen as uh, being in conflict. But as the music of the late Baroque and of the Enlightenment shows us, these are concepts that very much can exist uh, within the, uh, you know, the, the, the moral uh, makeup of a person. Um, the idea that you can, freedom of expression needs a framework of order and discipline is another thing that can be demonstrated very clearly by the work of an orchestra. Uh, the idea that culture and entertainment are not mutually exclusive, mm. uh, but that one, we must not make the mistake of putting one absolutely in the place of the other, but that they can coexist and that their areas of influence overlap. So uh, music, yes, music is a great force for um, integration and great force of, uh, as a great tool of uh, education as well. I mean, this has been written about a lot about, you know, music's ability to get kids to concentrate, learn about proportion, etc. Uh, but one of the very important things, again, if I may just add, I, want to, I don't want to go on for long, too long, but um, I think one of the main, um, uh, main uh, things uh, that, that demonstrated the power of music to me when I, was when I conducted in 2007 and 2008 uh, an extraordinary music camp in South Africa called Miyagi, which stands for Music is a Great Investment. And there, this is 2007, this is, these were kids from all races and all backgrounds coexisting in an orchestra and the culture, uh, when you think that the kids, these kids' parents, only 13 years earlier, could not sit on the same bus because of the colors of their skins. You could see in 2007 already that this culture, this, the, our belief, our possible belief in a, in a credible democratic future for South Africa, mm that you could not really believe in, in the street, in the supermarket, in the restaurant, in the workplace, the only place that you could believe in that and say, yes, I think this country is going to be all right, was where kids of different races sat and played Beethoven and Sibelius together. Uh, so I think that's in itself demonstrates what a huge force it is. Mm. And again, the cheapest and surest way for social cohesion and, 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 and peaceful coexistence. I'm sure we'll get on to more later. We will, yes. indeed. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Beautiful. So we'll hold our questions for each other and let the video speak a little bit. Our eyes, our ears, shine your light on the beautiful diversity of humanity. Look up, stretch your wings and fly.
all different. There is no such thing as a standard or run-of-the-mill human being, but we share the same human spirit. What is important is that we have the ability to create. However difficult life may seem, there is always something you can do and succeed at. The games provide an opportunity for athletes to excel, to stretch themselves and become outstanding in their field. So let us together celebrate excellence, friendship and respect. My mum uh, still wants to know when I'm going to get a proper job. <laughs> <laughs> she was there. So shall I start? Please do. Um, yeah. So much of that was rooted in, well, it wa was rooted in uh, mine and Bradley's, my co-directors, thing about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and for it to stop being just a piece of paper, this vacuous thing that just yeah. lying around, but something with the foundation of our ceremony. And our starting point was, all people are born equal, but we know they're not. And just in these last two weeks, two things have happened, and I am just fed up. One is, there's a real drive in the UK for equality, which is good, but a real understanding of that word diversity. It's banded about now. It's just become one of these lovely buzzwords that everyone goes, diverse, 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 but nobody actually means it. <laughs> so, someone has been quoted to say that if they really do need to embrace diversity in the truest meaning of the word, that it will dumb down the quality of the theatre, it will dumb down the quality of the training that they want to do because we, these people who are diverse, are not very good, really. So that upsets me, it pisses me off royally. And then yesterday, yesterday, I got an email from my work colleague saying, Jenny, please will you sign this petition? and it was from uh, one of our railway services. The staff have been encouraged that if they see a disabled person using a ramp to get onto the train, and there's some worry that the train might be delayed, don't help them, don't let them get on the train. I'm sorry, that's illegal, it must be illegal. So, all people are born equal, no, they bloody well are not. And we are still fighting, fighting to get on that bloody train to get to work. So when we talk about culture and does culture matter, at the moment we're just fighting to be recognised as humans, let alone be artists. So it worries me. It worries me a lot. And for those of you who went to the uh, talk today around 
disability. Thank you. Thank you for going. I wish it wasn't what an option. I wish it was something that everyone had to go to. Because it is 2018. And I think the deaf and sober community are wearing a little bit thin. We're a bit tired of having to fight this on our own. And I don't, I know that there is, um, we're trying to make it a global thing, the social model of disability. So much has been rooted in the past, the medical model. Oh, you do a, um, in a wheelchair, or you've got no legs, or you flap your hands around, or you, can you not hear? Um, how are you going to cope? You know, where are you going to fit in? This happened to me when I was at college, trying to go on, get into university. Well, it was a polytechnic, uh, lower than a university. I'm very proud of <laughs> polytechnic. <laughs> but um, they, they, they'd never had a deaf person on the course. And it, they say, you know, we, oh, we don't know, we don't know, you're a good dancer. You know, and I, you know, I had to prove that I, I could dance, prove that I had a coping strategy, prove that I could be self-motivated and go to the library and do my learning on my own. I thought going to college was about being with people, about engaging with lectures, being part of something, belonging. But oh no, I had to do all the sorting it out myself and all my other cont contemporaries, their experience of the educational system is the same. We have to sort it out. Well, we don't want to sort it out anymore on our own. We are much stronger when we are work together, when we have allies like people like you, people like us around the panel thinking, okay, how can we really work to address equality? And for me, always, the best way of doing anything is theatre. You know, I'm an artist and it's taking me till, how old am I now? 55? I'm getting old. It's taken me a long time to dare to use that word. It took me, I went deaf when I was seven. I finally allowed myself to say, I'm Jenny, I'm deaf, at the age of 24. When I met Grey Eye, I'll talk about Grey Eye later, but this amazing theatre company of other deaf and disabled people, I found where I belonged. So that took me to a trial of 24, and it's taken till just recently to dare to say I'm an artist. So I'm deaf, I'm a woman, I'm deaf, I'm an artist, I'm an activist with capital letters. I'm also a failed ballerina. <laughs> um, breasts and beer got in the way, so... But that's all right. <laughs> I've lost my thread now. Um, <laughs> what, what we need, what I need, is to be able to do more theatre. We do one or two shows a year. I work with little ones. I work with, I train the middle group, 18 to 25 year old, ready for their journey in the big wide world. And Grey Eye does two productions of our own in collaboration with other people. But it's not enough. It is not enough. I want to be on every damn platform that there is. I want to be there and able to train my little ones to know that they can reach for the stars. You know, they can, that sort of thing from you. You climb, if you reach for the stars, you can get to the top of the tree. Well, I want that ramp to the top of that tree if you're a wheelchair user or, or hoist or whatever. They can get up there. And it's also a quote from Stephen Hawking. When we, Jenny and I were so lucky, don't work with me on 2012, and we went to meet Professor Hawking. It was a bit scary because one of the other professors said to me, Jenny, have you read Professor Hawking's Brief History of Time? I thought, well, I've looked at it. <laughs> I didn't really understand it. Sweat was pouring down my back. I thought, please, Professor Hawkins, don't ask me anything. He asked lots and lots of questions about art, about our show, about what did we think about democracy, equality, and learning. He was the most twinkly man, and can you imagine? Our world, of he as a disabled man has been told, sorry, Prof, 
bye-bye, you're too disabled for our world. Go off and play and read nice books, but don't bother us. Think about how stupid our world would be without him in it. Bless him. He also gave us that quote, don't look down at your feet, look up at the stars and be curious. So although I'm perpetually angry with the lack of inclusion, the lack of equality, the fact that our train services is allowed to stop people, supporting disabled people, to get to work. I have to be, feed myself culturally with the theatre that we make to pray to dear God that somewhere along the line we can make connections. And back to the train thing, actually, Many, many years ago, the whole of our DLR um, train service was made accessible. It was like, oh, so we got some money to create a piece of work to say, finally, wheelchair users or people with mobility impairment are going to be down in the subway. We went down with our lovely Sophie, who's now long gone, but Sophie had a wheelchair with big wheels and wee wheels, self, self-propelling. Very small woman but she owned her own chair, she didn't need anyone pushing. She was beyond excited to go to the subway. She was like, oh my God, were you with me then? Yeah, it was amazing, wasn't it? So she went down, she said, oh my God, this is a bit scary. Right, we're about to get on a train, and the train comes. She goes, Jenny, I can't, I can't get on it. And the gap between the platform and the train was just a bit too big for her wheels. She would have gone in and gone, blah, blah, blah. So we couldn't. I was filming all of this. I got really, really told off by London Transport and had my camera taken. But the point was, they said to us, well, you know, your, your, your wheels are different. So they said, my wheels are my wheels. <laughs> they said, well, those wheels are too small. You know, we didn't, we didn't talk to anybody who had a wheelchair like yours. They had just gone for the general big wheel and thought that every single wheelchair user was generic and everyone would be able to get on the train. Not the point. So it really saddened me that I wasn't able to make the theatre that I wanted to make to challenge that. I think, and I was scared of transport from London. They're a massive organisation, grey eyes, very little. I think now, now I would do that play. I've got more confidence. Mm. But it's about, you said the word, it's about open dialogue. So we have to take that dialogue in and out of every single organisation, in and out of every single nook and cranny. Because we all have a responsibility for the social model of disability, which is, it's not about wrong, what's wrong with us. It's not about the fact that our wheels are too small, or that we sign, or that we speak differently. It's about what can we do, how can we be part of it, and how can you both engage and include us. I was at a conference in um, New York in, the, uh, in January. 500 people from 76 different countries for disabled people. How does that work? Where are we? Where are we as cultural leaders, policy makers, educationalists, artists? Where are we? So that is my provocation in a way. It's where are we? And what are we all going to do about it today to end all conferences forevermore and just do more doing than talking. Hmm. understandable miscalculation and what if 
on the basis of that, the world as we know it changed its matter of fact. Let me get it right. What if we got it wrong? What if we weakened ourselves, getting strong? What if we found in the ground a vial of proof? What if the foundations missed a vital truth? What if the industrial dream sold us out from within? What if our impenetrable defense sealed us in? What if our wanting more was making less? And what if all this wasn't progress? Let me get it right. What if we got it wrong? What if we weakened ourselves getting strong? What if our wanting more was making less? And what if all this it wasn't progress? What if the disappearing rivers of Eritrea, the rising tides and encroaching fear, what if the tear inside the protective skin of Earth was trying to tell us something? Let me get it right. What if we got it wrong? What if we weakened ourselves, getting strong? What if the message carried in the wind was saying something? Butterfly wings to the hurricane, it's the small things that make great change. And the question towards the end of the lease is no longer the origin, but the end of species. Let me get it right. What if we got it wrong? What if the message carried in the wind was saying something? Essentially, I'm a black man, uh, I'm a human being, uh, I'm, a I'm an Englishman, I'm a collection of molecules, I'm an Ethiopian, uh, I'm everything, I'm all these things, I'm none of them, I'm not one of them, I'm an artist, I'm a creative, I have everything to prove, I've got nothing to prove. Uh, I'm lost when not creating, I find who I am when I am creating, I am uncommissionable, I am open to commissions. <laughs> I live by deadlines, I'm very much alive, and uh, I, uh, I, uh, I have a similar opinion to yourself about uh, diversity and uh, positive discrimination. When people say to me that they don't want to lower the bar by just letting somebody in to wherever uh, wherever they're referring to, uh, by, you know, by judging on, you know, by allowing people in because of the, of the race, their race will, will lower the, the bar of the entire organisation and the whole thing will fall to pieces in a heartbeat. I think to myself, well, that's positive discrimination in action. That actually proves to me that positive discrimination works. Because the people who've benefited from positive discrimination for hundreds of years wear it so well that they can't see it in themselves. Positive discrimination has been happening for a long, long, long time. It's right at the heart of Belgian culture. It's right at the heart of English culture. Um, you could, if you like, call forced positive discrimination, colonialism. However, the fact that it's worked so well means that the beneficiaries are unaware of how well it has worked for them. So, very, it's very, very simple. It is that simple. And if once you can understand that, 
you can start to employ more people of other, col other colours and other, other abilities and, and you can start to hear an impact opinions that will enrich your existence and enrich your, your, your organizations. We were born diversity, diverse. We watch on television, we watch animals migrating. We've all, we, migration is at the heart of who and what we are. I migrated the moment I left my mother's womb. You migrate when you leave from the village to the town to the city. You migrate, ideas migrate, education is migration, marriage is migration. Migration is at the heart of who we are, which is why it is somewhat, uh, it, it has a, it has a, it has a, it has a, a distastefulness to be anti-migration. It causes friction, it's anti-human. We watch animals migrate day and night on television. And then we sort of transpose ourselves. The elephant has lost its child. Let's watch. You know, migration is at the heart of who we are, therefore to be anti-migration is to be anti-nature. You will watch your children grow wings and fly from your... You don't send your children to university and ask them to come back to the house when they've done and stay there. <laughs> <laughs> you will watch them and you will, you will call it growing wings and flying. They will leave the nest. Migration is at the heart of who we are. The word, I'm a poet by trade, is not owned by politics. It is who we are. Thank you. I'm playing to the audience. <laughs> so, so this idea that to, uh, to have more people of or, or, or other colours or other abilities or other genders is somehow attack on, on the status quo of any organisation is not true. It actually raises the bar. It doesn't lower it. It, it raises the game. It introduces new sparkling ideas. And let me tell you that the person who is excluded and who has been excluded is the most likely, is most likely, in my opinion, not to exclude others, is most likely to see the chinks in the armor of any uh, institution that, that believes itself to be solid. And, and these are actions that happen, uh, these are ideas that happen in the practice of, of I believe, uh, artists and uh, creatives. Um, I'll finish on this. I'll finish on this. Um, oh, it's such a big idea. I've got so much I want to say, but, 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 but I'll finish on this. Um, Superman was a foster child. Cinderella was fostered and adopted. Um, Heathcliff was an orphan. Uh, Superman was uh, uh, adopted. Uh, 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 Pippi Longstocking. Uh, Elf from the film Elf. Uh, you go through your cultural references and find out how many of those children were fostered, adopted, or orphaned. And then, and this is off the subject of diversity, but and then ask yourself, why have Harry Potter? <laughs> Harry Potter was a foster child. <laughs> and then ask yourself the simple question, why have we never made the connection between these people at the heart of popular culture, at the heart of our great stories, our great films, our great uh, books, at the heart of them? Oliver Twist, these are all English references, but well, I really do apologize. <laughs> um, but um, but uh, how is it that we've not made the connection between those people front and center in popular culture and the child in care, the fostered, adopted, or orphaned child in care, in the midst in a, a, of our societies. I believe that they suffer from prejudice. I do everything I can in my work as an artist to, uh, to show that, that those children's writers, those authors and filmmakers, Luke Skywalker was adopted and fostered, James Bond was fostered. <laughs> it's the truth, Ruth. Prejudice happens when you can't see the obvious and connect it to, 
to, um, to the real. Moses was adopted, he's real. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jesus had two dads. At least. Uh, uh. <laughs> so, I'll, I'll stop here, sorry. I'll stop here, but the point is, is that it, it is artists that understand not only that those characters are, um, are, are, are without family, but that through being without family, they see the power of family. All of the things that families don't want their children to know, like how hard it is to not have a family. All of those things, somebody who has not got a family can see. Sorry, that was very complicated. The point is, is that children in care, fostered, adopted, orphan children, they are extraordinary because they don't have the barrier of family to blame. So they're seekers, they're seers. They're not just good, they're extraordinary. They get extraordinarily angry, they get extraordinarily lost, but they are extraordinary. And it's my job as an artist to see our society in England understand that fact. And I can't tell you how many things I'm doing, uh, both uh, trying to push policy as well as work with young people in care uh, throughout Britain. I'm at the moment making a television uh, a documentary for Channel 4. Um, I, I've spoken about it in, in many other places. And uh, for, for young people in care, blah, blah, blah. And, um, yeah. <laughs> so, it, it really, it was, it was a trick. It wasn't necessarily a quiet living room chat. What you've had is, in about a half an hour or a little bit more, mm. a festival of activism and activists mm -hmm. on the stage, a festival that might have extended into days or weeks and hours of conversation and pushing and driving and a, just a taste of the work that all of the three of you are doing. I had a, a question for, for all of you and maybe we can carry it a little bit further. You're, you, you are all activists at the same time, agitators, working in and had the in, in some ways the opportunity to enter into a very, I say the opportunity was small o, um, institutional world, a very fixed institutional world, whether it's symphonic space, architect, arch, architect, orchestral sorry, space, the theater, the, the sort of deep rooted history of theater. You're working now with a university with this kind of, this, this, palace of learning. So my question is, how hard has it been to be that thorn in the side in these institutions, organizations, spaces, disciplines that actually you also hold very dear to you and want to keep but need to change? So what has it taken? What has helped you along the way? What are the small things maybe? But what is What's kept you going? Because you, you are a beautiful thorn in the side that we all need, art is. So a little bit of your experience, maybe Jenny, a little bit about the, the Paralympic experience. It was a big organizational, structured, established space. Um, it was massive. Not least the fact that Bradley and I had to go through the most rigorous, quite rightly in a way, a rigorous um, interview process. It was brutal, but we, I, I didn't realise I wanted that job. But suddenly I thought, oh, you know what? I do. I really, really want this job because I am damned if a non-disabled organisation leads on something that's so linked to the Paralympics, which shows the excellence of disabled sports people. Well, we want to be brilliant artists. They have to be like that because there's a real understanding, a bit like you were saying, a real understanding between the deaf and disabled communities 
of the barriers that we have had to just smash through to have a presence anywhere. The coping strategies, the, the, the sweat, the blood, the tears, the resilience, and the wibbly wobbliness that space is time to cry. So, back to what you've just asked me, trying to take on this corporate, corporate thing that was so ominous was a challenge. And I did become that thorn, and I'm very glad I did. I was a bloody good thorn because we had to change everything from the top down. And that is my mantra at the moment. If the top understands the philosophy of real inclusion, engagement, and things around disability, and the richness that we bring to the landscape, they get it. The rest, the rest of, well, bottom always get it anyway. But top down is what we did. But they thought that Bradley and I would do something nice. You know, it's the Paralympics. It will be a nice little show, but gentle, la, 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 no. Bradley and I have got big gobs, we're political, and we saw this as a chart to really put something in the heart of that stage and for the world to say, hang on, do not ever sideline us again. Because they had four um, ceremonies and one operations team to manage all four ceremonies, the operations team were just and they just said, look, it'll be fine. One glove fits all the shows. And Bradley and I said, no, no, some of our artists don't have hands. They don't wear gloves. It's not going to be the same. We are going to dare to be different, really different. But the thorn thing, it was having to choose the battles. I mean, I was, thank God I had Jen with me. Because sometimes we go to the accessible bathroom. I know we're not supposed to, but we're going there together so I can have a good old cry. Hey, blah, blah, whoever it was. Right, or I'm going to have a meeting with blah, blah. I need to get my armour on and go and say, come on. I became good. I became a politician. I didn't know I had that in me. But someone had to do it. And Bradley was busy being the brain, because he's got a massive brain. He was being clever, sort of producing the art stuff and with me in the mix. And I was just doing the lobbying. So between us, we were a very, very good combination. But we also did it through care. We cared passionately about our show. And when we talked to the government, you know, we had to do a presentation they were bewildered by what we had presented. They said, oh, it's about enlightenment. It's intelligent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, OK. And then Jeremy Hunt said, who was then the Minister of Culture, said, oh, um, I said to him, war makes more people disabled than anything else, doesn't it? Oh. And he had a big smile on his face. That, yes, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> so, it was like, oh, right, OK, we're going to have to really work hard at this. But bit by bit by bit, bringing in more and more disabled artists, asking for ramps, asking for flooring, for the cobblestones, for wheelchair users, talking around sign language, how we adapt to sway poles for people who are double amputees and watch them climb. Go, oh, it was the artists led by me and Bradley, that really pushed the agenda of change. And, and care, and humanity, and passion. And the other thing was humour. I was saying this to you last night. We did laugh. Our team laughed a lot. And one day, we were all like crying, crying with laughter. And we had an open door policy. And the, other, the rest of the team came, bounced down, go, oh my God, what's wrong, what's wrong? And we were like, oh, couldn't tell the story. We were laughing so hard. And someone said, we haven't heard the sound of laughter here for the best part of 14 months. And I thought, that's heartbreaking. You know, to laugh is relieved, to laugh is to engage, to laugh is to get it wrong, to laugh is to be fine with, be flawed, to laugh is to regroup. And that's what we did constantly. 
And through that, we really wrapped our arms around that operations team. Mm. So they came baff, they came on board with us. And they started to get the humour. And on the last day, the day of the actual show, one of my amputees had given me his beautiful um, metal heavy leg, a spare one. He wanted it on the set. So Jenny and I were walking around the whole stadium, bumping into various different people saying, have you seen anyone hopping? <laughs> it was, you had to be there, really. So it was amazing being on that field of play when someone's there with a big, thick rope and gaffer, and I say, oh, what are you doing? They say, oh, we're just laying down the flooring so that the blind people in navigation, they can, they can they know where they are on the set. I didn't have to do that anymore. They got it. So it was a real shift in environment, and our 3,500 volunteers, you know, from a really diverse range of life. But once we sat, we told them the story, and ask the question, do you want to be part of our community? Do you want to belong to this show? You don't have to, but if you don't want to, do go. But I would like you to belong. And that feeling of people just going, yeah, come on. Oh, yeah, we're on it. We really, really want to belong. And that cohesion of all of those volunteers with the professional artists and, of course, Professor Hawking, It was amazing. And for so many of those, uh, that operations team and those artists, when I still see them, it stayed. It stayed, sorry, I've talked far too much, but it's just being a thorn, being that broken record, it works, it works. So I will continue to be thorns to the government, to wherever I will work, but I'm quite a nice thorn, <laughs> an approachable thorn, I hope. Lem, care. Belonging was something that, yeah. that Jenny was talking about. I was just thinking then, though, about working in institutions, because as, as, an, as an artist, I try to... It's just that... Um, it's to say that creativity is not the monopoly of artists. It's to say that uh, when I was artist in residence at the South Bank Centre for six years, uh, I learned that from Jude Kelly. And she saw us in institutions as a kind of virus in a body we would find where the institution had solidified without real reason. And we would identify somehow that as we presented our processes to and within the institution. Mm -hmm. So we, we but, but, but what I learned from her is that actually creativity is as much a part of the arts worker within the institution, even if they don't know it, as it is in the artist. It is not the monopoly of artists. We're born creative. So an artist within an institution can enliven it and, if you like, challenge it. But actually, it's for the better of the institution. You know, why are there no pictures on the walls? Why are there no, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The questions get asked that actually make the place a better place to be for the workers and then for the community who, who engage with the institution. So my advice to anybody who who is in an institution that works with artists is to get yourself an artist in residence, give them an open brief, don't, don't, uh, don't uh, limit them to a series of workshops out there in the community, because the community is in that institution. It is not separate to it, it's a part of it. Um, mm. So we're viruses, that's what Jude <laughs> Kelly said, and I didn't like it when she said it, but it's true. Thorns and viruses and change makers. Hey, we're good though. Good, good. Yeah. No, this is and, and the, the spread of things is a very positive. We would it's like. It's not a fight if they're going to. Yeah. It's not a fight. It's not a challenge if somebody's paying me to be challenging. It's not a challenge. It's a game. Then, you know, there, there is something. There is some free form that the artists need to be able to um, make change. We have to be. Uh, compassionate critiques, critics of our institutions, because we work together with them. Exactly. Chem, in the work that you are doing in Lab for, a Laboratory for Democracy, how do you see that in changing, in poking, in using the form that you work in, but unpicking it in a way? 
Well, it's all about uh, making it, making what we do relevant. When we're talking about being a thorn on the side, uh, in Turkey's classical music business, we have uh, you'd find a lot of you know, the major institutions, the state orchestras, which we're per perfectly happy of playing more or less the same thing to the same thousand people week in, week out, year in, year out, and and then feel that that's that's okay because the hall was full, people looked happy. They clapped, and that's all they needed to do. Uh, but um, I've tried to go for. I've really believed in 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 one's ability to communicate music, and that music could be understood. I don't I don't like the terms understood, but in terms of opening channel, cha channels for people to get to why this music is so important. Uh, I had a chamber orchestra in Istanbul, which is no longer there. It's financed by a bank. Uh, which stopped financing it in 2011, but we used to do a lot of tours in Anatolia in places that would not necessarily have direct access to, to orchestras as such. Mm. And uh, I remember one colleague telling me, oh, I see you went to Marash or Kritahia where it was and played them Stravinsky. He said, how very naive of you. Uh, you should have played them Tchaikovsky and be grateful if you know, most of them didn't feel fall asleep. I said, no, you put things in context, you make a co uh, concert program tell a story and you go out of your way and you have to believe that without uh, recourse to any technical jargon, that you can open some channels of communications for mm. people. And I think for the most, uh, the most striking case for me over those years with touring with the Chamber Rocks, that was in Diyarbakir, uh, in the mostly Kurdish uh, southeastern province, one of the major cities in, in Turkey. And after a concert, a boy of 1920, university student, came up to me, very excited. He'd heard an, an orchestra, live orchestra for the first time live. And he came and said, oh, this is wonderful. Uh, this is not at all like listening to CDs. And I said, you're right, it isn't, but why do you think so? This is somebody who heard, just heard his first live orchestra. And he said, because you uh, brought something to life for us, something that was written in a completely different environment 200 years ago, 300 years ago. And the amazing thing he said was that when it was finished, it was no longer. And I thought, to hear something as profound as that about the need for orchestras and conservatoires to continue to exist, the, in, uh, in the irreplaceability of live music, music is something that mm -hmm. we do for you and something happens for us. We've just taken recordings for granted for too long and forgotten the real message of, of how, how music works in real time. And I thought, what this 19-year-old boy who'd never heard an orchestra until two hours before said to me, I could not learn anything as profound as that from anyone, let alone a student, after a concert in Berlin, Chicago, Paris, or Vienna. And that's where the magic of the, of the, of the music really is. And I think it's continuing to do, to, to, to really uh, expand that belief and, 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 uh, and make that guide my projects. Because if we don't believe in everyone having a right to good music, that good music and good musical education actually helps us be better citizens, better human beings, whatever, better neighbors, uh, then there's no point in, in it because it remains the, you know, the, the, the privilege of an elite that went to the same schools as we did, that dressed more or less as we do, and that is exactly what music is not about. You look at the lives of the great composers, nobody came from elite, rich families, you know. Uh, and that's, I think that, that in itself is a, is a great inspiration. So we have to start wrapping our time on the stage here. Unfortunately, I think we could go on for a really long time, but mm -hmm. we have an opportunity here. And if each of you would be willing to a really short challenge for all of us. So it's not only a challenge from the work that you do an artist to the philanthropic community, but what we can do together. So what philanthropy and artists and activists can do together. What would be the first thing that you would, uh, would say? Jenny or Lem, have you got... Who would like to kick off? Out of mass Quickly. artist res residencies, mass artist uh, residencies across the country, in legal firms, in, fi in the city of London, uh, I would have uh, an artist like uh, uh, Grayson Perry to oversee the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then see, uh. see what happens. <laughs> and see what happens. Parliament right. the lot. Send yeah. it out there. Jenny. I've got sort of two things, and one of them sort of personal. You know, I have been at Grey Eye Theatre Company, you know, and it's the UK's flagship deaf and disabled theatre company for 21 years in August. It's extraordinary. I did do the Paralympics. I'm very, very proud of what I've achieved, and yet I still have to jump hoop after hoop after hoop to prove 
for the gatekeeper, the purse people, the people with the money, that I can do what I do. There's still a, 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 res a thing that maybe I'm a risk, that I'm not good, that I'm st that the seeds of self-doubt just go through me. And I'm, I don't want to be like that anymore. I want people to trust that I'm good and that the people that I work with are beyond good, they're brilliant. And I loved what you said about, you know, it's so amazing. I will talk about briefly about the Gulbeki because Andrew get, said, right, Jenny, what are you doing next year? I said, I'm doing a big show with wounded veterans. He said, how much do you think you need? I said, a lot of money. He said, well, let me get back to you, but I'll give you a watch. And that was like, wow. So I thought, yes, I'm on it. I've got there. But it's all the other partners have made it really, really hard. So when you're just given that money and you go, oh, wow. I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. That openness, rather than be locked in, fixed, this is what you have to do. Mm. We as artists, when we give a five pen, five euros, we, we can be it. so yeah. amazing with five euros. So trust us. Yeah. Stop all the accountability, the jumping through the hoop. Trust us, we awesome. will make great art. Jim. <laughs> okay, I'd like to, uh, before my... Uh, a message and provocation as such. I'd like to leave you with an image. Next time you go to an orchestral concert, notice how, you know, they tune at the beginning, they come on stage, and who gives the first A? It's the oboe. And everybody tunes according to the A, 443 hertz per minute, whatever, of the oboe. Why the oboe? Think of, uh, ask yourselves a question. Well, I'll tell you the answer now. <laughs> um, the oboe is the instrument that has the least capability to play higher or lower with a fixed instrument and a fixed mouthpiece. I think, and the fact that everybody adapts their tuning to the person on stage of the 100 people that has the least flexibility mm. to adapt to the others, I think gives us a great uh, thing to think about. It's a little bit like the, the well-tempered system in classical music, where in the 18th century, people suddenly decided to slightly deform the order of natural sounds that nature gives us to allow us to uh, play in both minor and major scales in every, in every note, in every key. And that for me is a great symbol of what music is really about because it says that if we are all equally wrong, just a little bit, and, and, and realize the possibility in every situation that the neighbor may be right, that, re that instead of insisting on our own truth, uh, I think that creates a different kind of, uh, a completely new kind of um, dialogue in society and equal temperament comes with the Enlightenment, it's very important. And I think my provocation, therefore, is <laughs> I think it's very important for this universal musical culture to be sustained in Turkey, but not only for Turkey's safety itself. I'm in the middle of a massive uh, fundraising uh, uh, effort at the moment for this summer's tour of the Turkish National Youth Orchestra, so going to major European centers, as well as playing a lot, of, uh, a lot of concerts in Turkey and doing social workshops, et cetera, in Turkey itself. But do consider this it is not only important to support the continuation of such things in Turkey in a, in a, as a conveyor of, of universal values, but I think it is also important for Europe itself to keep Turkey in the fold as far as uh, subscribing to certain universal values are concerned, and nothing can do this better than music. Mm. I think this idea that uh, you know, Islam and democracy has been talked a lot about can coexist. Only music will make that possible. And I think it is therefore also in the interest of European philanthropy to keep Turkey included in the mold, because if we leave it to uh, an 100% social funding system that we've had so far, these things may not survive in Turkey. And we will lose the, um, the, most, tangible, uh, uh, the most tangible asset, asset that we have about Turkey and Europe having a common identity and Turkey having some kind of contribution to make to to Europe. And I think that goes through, uh, too long probably to go into details now, but uh, it is no, I think it is no secret that, um, that music is, is the greatest tool that we have to achieve that. Thank you. So talk to I me at dinner, that's the provocation. Thanks. <laughs> Jenny. A final plea, because I haven't been on a panel with these gentlemen before, we're Jen, Lem and Kazem. So could we set up the Jen, Lem and Kazem Theatre <laughs> Creative Laboratory, which you will find and will create a beautiful European global network <gasps> of stuff. 
Yes. Yes. So that, that you heard that today, a new, new art organisation funded by you. We're on it. <laughs> and on the... The on most the... exciting cultural activism that's happening in England at the moment is around women. I just wanted to say that. That's... Uh, it's just the truth, Ruth. Grabbing it's these zeitgeist. final words, Lem. This is beautiful. It's the zeitgeist baby. <laughs> and it's on. <laughs> it's switched on. <laughs> We wanted to kind of bookend also with another of Lem's poems called <gasps> Invisible Kisses. And uh, before the, the, we say thank you and goodbye to the panel. So one more video. If there was ever one whom when you are sleeping, who would wipe your tears when in dreams you are weeping, who would offer you time when others demand, and whose love lay more infinite than grains of sand. If there was ever one to whom you could cry, who would gather each tear and blow it dry, who would offer help on the mountains of time, and who would stop to let each sunset soothe your shades of mind. If there was ever one to whom, when you run, who will push back the clouds so that you are bathed in sun, who would open arms if, if you would fall and, and show you everything if you lost it all. If there was ever one whom when you achieve, was there before the dream and even then believed? Who would clear the air when it's full of loss and count love before cost? If there was ever one whom, when you are cold, who will summon warm air for your heart to hold, who would make peace in pouring pain and, and make laughter fall in falling rain. If, if there was ever one who can offer you this and more, who in keyless rooms can see open doors, who in open doors can see open fields and in open fields see harvests yield. Then, then see only my face in the reflection of these tides through the clear water, beyond the riverside. All I can send is love, and all that this is. A poem and a necklace of invisible kisses. So thank you so much, Jenny and Jenny and Lem and Chem, for our living room conversation and for bringing so much of your art to the stage and to our space and to the conference, con conference Culture Matters. Thank you. Um, now moving from this living room to the dining room, we're all really warmly invited by Luc Taillard de Borm and the King Baudouin Foundation to gather together at the Bellevue Museum, which is five minutes away walking. So there will be plenty of guides around to help you get there. And a little inside tip, apparently, we'll be able to go before dinner into the lower under the ground to see the foundations of the old medieval city that 
uh, Brussels was built upon. It's opened up, so don't get too detoured to the bar. <laughs> there will also be a bar amongst <laughs> the uh, archaeological site. So um, it's a very full evening in front of you. Join me in thanking the panelists. And now to get the feet tapping and ready to walk and ready to dance, welcome back Fan for Kids.